I'm here to talk today about behavioral insights for value creation. And as you can see from my first slide and uh, from the letters after my name, I went through a little bit of a career transition a few years back. Uh, I used to be a clinical psychologist. And now I'm a customer loyalty strategy consultant. Uh, so it's a little different, um, but actually there's a lot that is pretty similar. So as a psychologist, of course, I used to work with individual clients who had complex psychological needs. Um, as a consultant, I work with organizational clients with complex customer challenges. And fundamentally, it's all about people. Uh, but really importantly, it's all about taking the evidence from scientific research and turning it into useful strategies to help people lead better lives. So when we're talking about behavioral insights, we're talking about the application of research in the behavioral sciences like psychology, sociology, uh, and how we bring those insights to business and social challenges. Uh, behavioral insights enable us to create value because they actually let us draw on a rich body of research into relatively stable attributes of human reasoning to help us at least predict how customers might react as we continue to adjust to the ever-changing context. Um, it's especially valuable now. We know that COVID has, you know, really changed everything and changed the way that we interact. So at least, you know, some things can be stable and, and, and often that's just how humans reason and think and behave. But when we try to take science and make it useful, it's you know, not easy. Most people don't have a background in science or psychology. And you know, as much as we'd love to be able to say that you can just read nudge and start adding decoys to billion dollar businesses, applying science well is a process. Um, and the fact that science and uh, translating science into strategy is hard shouldn't stop us from trying. In fact, it's critical. If you want to start thinking about how human beings behave and making decisions for people, start with the science. Start with understanding what researchers have found and what they know about how humans behave and how they think. So today I'm going to start by outlining a process that you can use uh, to start thinking about how to use behavioral insights for value creation uh, with some lessons from my past life as a clinical psychologist. So one thing we know is that human beings are really not good at making decisions. Uh, we ignore facts. We act on our gut instincts. We listen to advice from all the wrong people. Um, and COVID has actually really shone a light on how bad we are at using information well. And there's some good reasons for it, um, especially when it came to COVID. I mean, there's not enough time to take in all the information that existed. Uh, there's too much information, too much conflicting information. How do we make sense of it? And quite frankly, very few of us are medical practitioners and medical scientists, so we don't understand a lot of the information that's out there. So we use shortcuts. And when we use shortcuts, these shortcuts can be made into nudges. Nudges are simple, low-cost interventions that help customers and citizens take actions that are in their own best interest. So here's some examples. I'm sure that we've all dealt with the awkwardness of tipping uh, when we're not really sure how much to tip. I think we, we have a good sense at restaurants, but there's other places where you don't know. And so tipping often uses defaults. Defaults help us to understand and how to make sense of this ambiguous situation, how much to tip by giving a pretty good suggestion. And I mean, if you can think about the times there you've tipped and you've looked at the default, how often you actually stray from the default, it's probably pretty rare that you go under, probably if the service has been really bad or over if the service has been really great or you're feeling particularly wealthy that day. Um, but it's pretty rare that you deviate. Uh, the decoy nudge. So I, I don't know if you've tried the Grand Big Mac. I have, I don't know, it was a dare. And that thing is huge. And I'm 100% certain that the Grand Big Mac exists only to make us think that the Big Mac is a smart uh, choice for our health. So this is a decoy. The Grand Big Mac exists to sort of decoy us into thinking, well, that's wild. I'm going to stick with a regular Big Mac. And then here's a really sort of well-known study in the field of psychology. And you've probably seen this if you've ever been to a hotel, which hopefully lots of you guys have. When you go to a hotel, you are often asked to reuse your towels. This helps with the environment. Um, but what they found is that when they measured different kinds of requests, they actually found that um, using social proof is a really much more effective way of making people reuse their towels. So social proof is, you know, when you don't know what to do, what do we do? You look to what other people are doing. So social proof saying that 75% of your fellow guests have participated in our reuse and recycle program is likely to make you 
reuse and recycle your towels. Now, here's the weird thing. Um, and it's a research question we should always ask is what about Germany? Well, they tried this in Germany and it didn't work. Science doesn't always translate simply into the real world. That isn't surprising. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that can be different between, you know, what is done in experimentation and how it looks when it's being scaled. Firstly, the intervention might be different. Sometimes it's a question of font. Sometimes it's the way of delivery. Sometimes when organizations have to adapt nudges to the constraints that they have, they might do things just a little differently in a way that they don't think will make a difference. And it turns out it makes a big difference. People are different. So, you know, we've got a lot of research that's performed on convenience samples uh, that are made up of university students taking first year psychology courses. And I think we have to really be thoughtful of the fact that those findings that we find on these, you know, highly educated young people don't necessarily apply to a lot of different populations, like seniors, like newcomers, like members of a wide range of underserved populations. And what I think really was um, the, the, the problem here in, in Germany is, is really that, you know, the, the context is different and the people, sorry, and the people are different, both of these things. In Germany, reusing and recycling is much more common than it is in the US. So if we're telling people that 75% of people who stay in the room or stay in the hotel reuse and recycle their towels, that's actually a low number to Germans. So it's not likely to increase the number. The important thing is here is that, you know, when you're using this kind of nudge, it has to add new information. It has to actually give somebody something different. And you can only determine what's gonna be new information by understanding the culture and the context. So, you know, when we're taking lab from, science from the lab to the real world, it's a multi-step process. So when I was a clinical psychologist, I was a child psychologist and I worked a lot with families. Um, and I was in my late twenties and my early thirties and inevitably um, somebody would ask me, do you have kids? And I didn't. Um, and they would say, well then, you know, like how the hell do you think you should be giving us advice about what we should be doing about our child? And now that I have a child, I actually think maybe they were a little bit right. Um, but at the time I would respond, I know a lot about what most kids do. You know a lot about what your kid does. And the goal that we have here is to put our knowledge together and try a few things and see what works for you. And clinical psychologists are trained in what we call the scientist practitioner model. And that's why it takes seven years minimum to get a PhD in clinical psychology. First, you have to learn how to do the science and understand the science. And then you actually have to like practice and work on how to use the science. So if I had a client with something like anxiety or depression, I would follow a number of steps. And the first steps would be review the science. We have to know what works. There's a world of evidence out there for what works with different kinds of psychological disorders. And you should know it if you're gonna be working with a client with one of these disorders. But let's say I had somebody with anxiety in my office, I'm not just gonna walk in there and start flooding them and hope that that's gonna make things better. I have to use empathy. I wanted to understand the context, the client's experiences, and tailor the intervention to really work for them. Because if you think about it, you know, a, a, a treatment for anxiety like flooding or systematic desensitization is gonna work really differently when somebody's got trauma in their history versus not. The next step, of course, is to work together. Uh, you don't just give a client a solution, you work with them to find the right one for them. How is it gonna fit in your life? How's it gonna work for you? How are you gonna do this? You make plans. Um, and then finally, you actually try it out and you recognize that you're gonna have to iterate. You're gonna have to do it again and again and learn from outcomes, maybe change things up and try things that are different. Now, when we're talking about clinical psychology, of course, the goal is to treat individuals. Um, we wanna give them coping skills. We wanna give them resiliencies. We wanna make their lives better. Um, I was not great at it because I always found it a little bit frustrating to help one person at a time. It's really noble work, it's important work, um, but it's part of what led me to look to get an MBA because the work that I do now is, is a little bit different. It's kind of the opposite. I actually focus on identifying the human problems, but then I look to fix the structures, the products and the services. I don't look to fixing the humans. And this is incredibly important in the world of finance, which we describe in the article that I'm talking about today. Personal finance is complex, it's confusing, it's ambiguous. Um, the way that banking and personal finance work was designed 
eons ago by let's say a very, very specific user group that doesn't really represent the world of financial customers today. Most people in the world are really not that great at managing their finances. So when I use behavioral insights with banks, we like to start from a place of saying, you know, and realizing and coming together on the fact that it's actually not the customer's fault that they're not good at finance. It's the bank's fault. It's the bank's responsibility. So if they want to help people get better at finance, they can't keep saying, well, why don't they understand? Or why can't we, you know, how do we teach them? They actually just have to change the way that they do business. They have to design the products and services that they use to make sense with how people actually think and how they behave. So I wanted to just share quickly a case study that's described in the article. Before I do, of course, I want to shout out my co-authors, uh, Jane Howe, Alex Henderson, and Sarah Reed, who I think might be listening today. But um, anyway, they were wonderful collaborators, and we worked together on this project um, and writing this book chapter at when I used to be at Deloitte. So we were working with a Canadian bank that wanted to create a seamless mortgage renewal experience. So first, of course, you look to the science. And there's a lot of different scientific literature around how people make these kinds of important financial decisions. And there was a couple of things that we found that were a bit in conflict. First of all, if you wanna reduce hassles, which is what the bank initially really asked us to do, they wanted it seamless, they wanted it easy, they wanted it fast, um, you can increase conversion. But going too fast can result in decreased trust. So we tried to understand the context. We did interviews with customers to get insights into their experience. And you might think talking to people about mortgages is going to be boring, but it was actually fascinating. The story is often one of triumph. People get their first mortgage and they feel like they were screwed. They didn't know uh, about the rules. They didn't have many offers. They didn't have, you know, much money or much credit. Um, and they, you know, feel, felt like they were taken advantage of by the bank they worked with. And in the five years since that first mortgage to the second mortgage, a lot happens. People pay every payment on time, which they feel like, you know, I deserve some credit for that. Um, maybe they get um, promoted in their job and they're earning more money. Maybe they get married and they're combining economics with somebody else. Uh, they have a kid. And uh, what they want at that point um, is not something that happens fast, but they want a seat at the table. So, you know, we work together to, to collaborate on a solution with different stakeholders. And that solution was, you know, we came up with a few different possibilities. Um, some that had that friction, um, that positive friction of sort of giving that person that seat at the table and some that were really fast and seamless. And so when you put it in front of people and you say, and even if they say, they can verbalize and say, I want it easy. This is so boring. I hate renewing my mortgage. If you give them an easy option, they will not take it. Um, and that was kind of really surprising. And it, it really speaks to that need sometimes to add that kind of positive friction to give people a sense of respect um, in the experience. Um, so now ideally, of course, um, in the test and iterate phase, um, you wanna be able to get as close as you can to a very traditional scientific randomized control trial. Um, we know that's not always possible, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't try to get as close as you can. I, I always like to use the word rigorous uh, when we talk about applying behavioral insights um, to business. You know, we can't always be rigorous, but we can try as hard as we can uh, to be what I like to call rigorous and, and to do as close as we can possibly go. Um, so now uh, I have a different question that clients ask me, not about how I, you know, can dare to give them advice on child rearing, but, you know, I work with clients in so many different industries. And, and of course, you know, I've been asked and I was asked on that banking project, you know, how am I supposed to tell them about their business that they've known for decades? Um, and I, to be honest, I give almost the same answer. I know a lot about how people think and behave. That's the science. And I can look that up and I can do research and I can find out. Um, and you can find out too. You can use Google Scholar. You can look up studies and you can find out what's going on. And then I say to my client, you know a lot about your business, which they do. And we both need to learn about what your customers need, which we do. Um, quite often that's something that's missing. Um, people make a lot of assumptions about what human beings want or need. And our goal is to collaborate on the solution. We wanna bring all of that information together and co-create solutions with stakeholders and customers in the room, along with the scientific evidence. And then we wanna try a few things and see what works. As I said, ideally we wanna create a randomized control trial, but if we can't, we wanna at least test them out. Um, 
And the goal of all of this is really to just find a way to bring you know, humanity back to the work that we do in business um, and to do it in a really responsible way that involves combining uh, the science of human behavior um, and empathy uh, to understand what people need and to work with them to find the solutions for their own needs.